Welcome to this rapid revision video looking at the weapons and wounds of World War I. This is an important component of your course because if you're going to understand the challenges of the medical services we need to understand how men got hurt. We'll look at health issues in a separate video. So let's get into it. Firstly the weapons of war. This diagram helps to explain how the weapons of defence in World War I, at least at first, outweighed the weapons of attack. Both sides were dug into their trenches by the end of 1914 and were essentially evenly matched. Defensive weapons and technology, like machine guns, barbed wire, had developed a lot further than offensive attacking weapons like rifles and light machine guns. New technologies and tactics were developed to break the stalemate, more on that another time, but in the situation of trench warfare, the only option was a frontal assault, attacking straight towards the enemy in full view. The odds were generally stacked in the defender's favour, and the wounds that soldiers could pick up were devastating. Let's have a quick look at the weapons of war. The most common and basic infantry weapon was the bolt-action rifle. A British Lee Enfield rifle is shown here. These weapons weren't especially new, but they could fire up to 10 bullets before they needed reloading. Pointed bullets caused deeper wounds. They were accurate, long-ranged and deadly in trained hands. More famously in the First World War is the machine gun. These guns fired identically deadly bullets to the rifles. In fact, the very same ammunition was used. The difference was, though, that they could fire up to 600 bullets a minute, the equivalent of 100 rifles. They were deadly against tra attacking troops advancing in the open, as was so often the case in World War I. However, I've left the most deadly weapon for last. By far the most wounds and deaths in the First World War were caused by the use of artillery. These cannons were the biggest killers of the war, causing almost half of all casualties. They could fire high explosives or shrapnel, a shrapnel shown, is, uh, shown to the right, which would shower hot metal onto the trenches miles away. Millions of shells were fired per battle. Bombardments lasted weeks or even months, not just hours. Recall mechanisms meant that they could fire more quickly without needing re-aiming, and so they were much more accurate than they had been in previous wars. So clearly, there were lots of weapons that could do awful damage to soldiers. But let's have a look at what the effects of these weapons were. Two of the most common wound types relate to wounds caused by bullets and shrapnel, and the damage was devastating in either case, but somewhat different. It's a gruesome thought, but you do need to consider what high-velocity bullets and shrapnel do to the human body. Wounds were rarely neat and tidy. Bullet wounds are referred to as GSWs in the army, gunshot wounds. World War I rifles were incredibly powerful, and the wounds that they caused were terrible. The damage was caused in stages, as shown in this image of a gel replicating flesh. It has been shot by a rifle bullet. First, we have the entrance wound or hole, which was typically quite small. But then inside, the concussive blast damage causes uh, wide cavities, which can smash bones and leave holes within the body. And then we've got the exit wound, sometimes. The bullet might come out the other side, or if it's lost enough velocity or maybe hit something going through, it may be left lodged within the body. And here's where we can see lodged bullet fragments and dirt, which cause an infection risk. So being hit by a World War I bullet, as you probably could expect, was a really bad day. But what about the shrapnel? Was this even worse? Well, sometimes it could be. Source A is a drawing from World War I, but it is quite gruesome, so I provide a bit of a warning for this. It shows a comparison of the damage caused by a bullet, which may be fairly superficial in comparison, and the damage caused by a large piece of shrapnel, which would be part of the shattered case of an artillery shell, or maybe one of the bits of shrapnel deliberately loaded into it. The effects were terrible. Early in the war, men hit in the legs had only a 20% survival rate. The reasons for this were blood loss, damage to vital organs and shock, and infection. In the First World War, 41,000 men in the British Army had limbs amputated, and 60,000 men had facial injuries, even though steel helmets were introduced in 1916. Some men lost noses, eyes, or even entire jaws to shrapnel. That's the thing, a helmet might stop shrapnel if it has lost enough velocity. It rarely worked against a bullet, though. Deadly bullets and shrapnel were not the only danger. One of the most horrifying has to be the effects of gas. Deadly gas was first used near Ypres in 1915. Soon both sides used it. Originally, it was released from canisters and drifted on the wind, but later special artillery shells delivered it, 
There was chlorine gas, which suffocated people and caused acid to build up in the lungs. There was phosgene. This was the most deadly gas. It caused the nerves to shut down, stopping breathing and the heart. And then there's mustard gas. Less deadly overall, but it caused horrible blisters on the skin and could even cause blindness. This source shows temporarily blinded victims of a chlorine gas attack. Gas was truly horrific, and it, but it wasn't as deadly as it might be feared. Around 5% of all British deaths were due to gas. Many victims of the symptoms of chlorine and mustard gas were only temporarily affected. To begin with, urinating on a cloth and holding it over the mouth was the only defence. The ammonia acted like the, uh, against the chlorine. All the armies also developed increasingly effective gas masks, which, with warning, were very effective at stopping the gas. Early on, these might be chemical so soaked masks with uh, mouth coverings. Later on, a more sophisticated bag arrangement with eye holes was created. And then later, there were more sophisticated respirators with proper filters, which were connected by that hose there. And they were even available for horses. This source references a gas attack, and it is simply called gassed. It's by American John Singer Sargent, who was an artist working for the British government. He painted it in 1919, so the year after the war finished. This painting was completed in the following circumstances, and it's important to bear these in mind when you're judging its usefulness. Sargent was employed by the British government to depict the war, and Sargent actually went out to France to view and sketch scenes of the war to base his paintings on. Sargent included lots of realistic details. For example, look towards the centre of the image at the exaggerated step of the blind man trying to find his way across that much smaller step. Sargent painted this after the war was over, but it was based upon his notes and sketches. The painting is not of a specific event, but is meant to be representative of the conditions. So consider its usefulness for an inquiry into the following things. The effects of gas and how the wounded were evacuated from the front. Well, if we take the first inquiry, it is quite useful. You can see the sorts of wounds that men have suffered and the fact that they've been blinded, but that otherwise they don't seem to be too badly harmed as they're able to move themselves. But what about how the men were evacuated? Well, clearly the men are brought out in large groups, with just a few men with sight helping them to, to make their way out. The men all seem to be assembled together as well. This suggests that uh, people with similar wounds and similar effects would be grouped together for treatment, which makes sense. So overall, this is a really useful source for learning about the effects of gas. Let's practice that skill for a moment. The text here might be quite small, so you might want to make this full screen and make sure that it's in HD. Which of the sources A to D is useful for an inquiry into the topics listed? Gas attacks, health problems in the trenches, the dangers from artillery, the dangers from infection in wounds. Let's have a look at our first source. Start thinking about which is this is relevant to. Source A shows soldiers of the East Yorkshire Regiment having their feet inspected by their medical officer near Rodenkor on the 9th of January 1918. This trench looks to be in fairly good condition, with duckboards above the mud to keep their soldiers' feet dry. Source B, from a report on gas gangrene by Anthony Bowlby, consulting surgeon of the British Army in 1914. Now be careful here, gas gangrene does not necessarily relate to gas. The gangrene found amongst our wounded soldiers is directly due to the infection introduced at the time of the wound, and it is likely to occur if muddy clothing has been carried by the projectile or if um, earth has been carried by the explosion. Source C is from the diary of Sister Catherine Lard of, of the Queen Alexandra Nursing Sisters. On the 15th of April 1915, she wrote this. ADMS stands for the Assistant Director, Medical Services. This afternoon, the medical staff on both divisions have been trying experiments in a barn with chlorine gas, with and without different masks soaked in some antidote such as lime. All were busy choking and coughing when they found the ADMS of the 5th Division getting blue and suffocated. He's had too much chlorine and was brought here looking very bad, and for an hour we had to give him fumes of ammonia till he could breathe properly. He'll probably have bronchitis, but they found out what they wanted to know. That if you put on this mask, you can go to the assistance of men overpowered by gas, with less chance of you finding yourself dead too when you get there. And source D, from the memories of Private Harry Patch of the Duke of Cornwall's Light Infantry, describing events in 1917. Harry Patch was one of the last survivors of the First World War, he lived until 2010. The shelling was bad. You could hear the big shells coming over, though if you could hear them, that was all right. They'd just gone over. You never heard the whiz bangs coming. They were just there and you never heard the shell or the bullet that hit you. Of course, whiz bangs were shrapnel and that was worse than a bullet. A bullet wound was clean. Shrapnel would tear you to pieces. 
It was a whiz-bang that killed my three friends and wounded me. It was just bad luck. We had those four ammunition magazines over our shoulders fully loaded. That's why they all got blown to pieces. So which source goes with which inquiry? If you want to work that out, press pause now. If not, I'll go through the answers. Source A relates to B, health problems in the trenches. The men have got trench fit, or at least it's being inspected. Source B relates to inquiry D, the dangers from infection in the wounds. Don't get misled by the phrase gas gangrene. It's got nothing to do with poison gas itself. Because it's source C which relates to gas attacks. And source D, well, that relates to the dangers from artillery. Source B actually relates, I should say, to the dangers from infected wounds. Some final points then. The First World War was characterised by the strength of defensive weapons like artillery and machine guns. Artillery was the biggest killer, with shrapnel causing large and complex wounds. The power of rifle and machine gun bullets also caused traumatic GSWs or gunshot wounds. Gas led to new challenges for medical services. Added to this was the huge number of medical issues that soldiers faced on the Western Front in terms of disease and illness, both physical and mental. We will cover those illnesses and the ways that wounds were treated in future videos. But for now, that gives you an overview of the sorts of wounds that soldiers had inflicted upon them by the First World War. I hope it's been useful to you, and if it has, please like the video and subscribe to the channel for more. But in the meantime, I'll say thanks very much for watching, and goodbye.